In this lesson, we are going to review integration by parts. I hope you've seen this technique of integration before. I'll quickly talk through the notation and do the derivation, but we're mostly going to focus today on doing examples. So what we have with integration by parts is you're looking at the product of two expressions. Say you have two functions here, and you can identify one that you would like to call f of x and the other one which you would like to call g prime of x. The idea is that f is a function you wouldn't mind differentiating, and g is a function you, you wouldn't mind anti-differentiating. If you can do both of those actions, then you can take this integral here, which I've set up as a definite integral, but it could be indefinite as well, and rewrite it in this form. So this is the expression for a definite integral. You would write it as the product of f of x times g of x evaluated at a and b according to the fundamental theorem of calculus. So there's no integration left here minus an integral that looks kind of like what you started with, but the roles are reversed. So minus the integral from a to b of f prime of x, g of x, dx. That's the statement of integration by parts, and I'll show where this expression comes from um, when we do the derivation in just a second. But let me quickly mention this notation that I like better when I'm actually working out problems. And that is, I'll look at an integral, and I'll identify one of the product terms, so what I would have called f of x here, I'll call that u, the rest of it I'll call dv. u is what I'll differentiate, dv is what I'll anti-differentiate. Then the right-hand side is going to be the product uv, evaluated at a and b, minus the integral from a to b of v du. So again, you can see that I reverse the roles of u and v on both sides of this equality. The derivation is straightforward. It comes right from the product rule. You've probably seen this, assuming that you've already learned integration by parts and that we're just reviewing this. If you haven't, you might want to pause and actually write down d dx of the product f of x times g of x. See what you get, rearrange terms, take integrals, and, and try to get back this first line. Okay, here's what I hope you got. From the product rule, the derivative of fg is f prime times g plus f times g prime. Like that. Now, I would like to move this, mi this middle term here to the left. So I'll have the derivative of this product minus f prime g equals fg prime. That's all great, except I'm also going to flip the sides of the equality at the same time. So let me write this one first, and we'll say fg prime equals this one minus that one. So the derivative of f times g minus f prime g. probably should have given myself a little bit more room. Let me just do this. Okay, there we go. Let's integrate all three terms. So I'm going to drop in the integral from a to b dx, the integral from a to b dx, minus the integral from a to b dx. This term on the left and this term on the right are exactly what we have on our first line up here. We just have to kind of reconcile this middle term. We are taking the antiderivative of a derivative. So I'm going to integrate d dx. Uh, integration and differentiation are inverse processes, so what that's going to return me back is just f times g. So it's like take the derivative and then anti-differentiate. So we will have this whole left-hand side. Nothing is going to change here. So the definite integral from a to b of f times g prime. Here, again, we're anti-differentiating a derivative, so we're going to get back the integrand, f of x, g of x. In this case, it was a definite integral from a to b. So it looks like that. And then minus everything else, which is the integral from a to b of f prime g. So you can see integration by parts is almost a restatement of the product rules, what it feels like. Now that we've just quickly looked at the formula and the notation, 
we're going to use this middle notation because it's shorter. I mean, you can literally see it's shorter. We're going to use that in our examples. Now we're just going to work through several examples. Let's start with this example for an integration by parts problem. We have here the definite integral from 0 to 1 of x times e to the x dx. So this is clearly a product of two, two expressions here, x and e to the x. So you started thinking, is there one I would like to differentiate? Is there one I'd like to anti-differentiate? And let me write out the two possibilities. So possibility one, let's let u be the first term. du be the second term, which I'm going to include not just e to the x, but also dx. Oh, sorry, dv. u is x, dv is e to the x dx. If that's the case, then du is 1 dx whereas v is e to the x. This is the style kind of breakdown between u and v that I like to do when I do integration by parts problems. So I identify u dv, and then I take u and, and partner it with du. I have to anti-differentiate dv here, so just be careful you go that direction. So if dv is e to the x dx, that means that v is e to the x. This looks pretty good. This would lead me to the right-hand side of our integration by parts formula, which would look like uv, so x e to the x from 0 to 1, minus v du. So it's like you reverse the rule. So first line, this, and then minus the second line. 1 e to the x dx. This looks quite good. In fact, let me go ahead and finish this, and then we'll look at the second possibility. So for this product uv here, I'm going to plug in the top bound, subtract off plugging in the lower bound. So that's going to be 1 e to the 1 minus 0 e to the 0 minus the antiderivative of e to the x evaluated from 0 to 1. So that's going to be minus e to the x, 0 to 1. So we're going to have e minus 0 minus e minus 1. So e to the 1 is e, e to the 0 is 1. And overall, this is going to be positive 1. All right. So we, we did it. We integrated this using integration by parts. I was so happy when I saw this breakdown here. I didn't really feel like uh, leaving it. But now that we've actually worked out what the answer is, let's take a look at the other possible breakdown between u and v, and we'll discuss why it's not better than what we've already done. In fact, it's worse. So the other possibility would be to reverse the roles here and have u be e to the x dv as x dx. Neither piece here is too hard to work with, but look what happens now when I write the second line. du is e to the x dx. v is 1 half x squared. That means that if I wrote the right side of our integration by parts formula, this would lead to uv, so x squared e to the x over 2. minus v du. So that would be x squared e to the x over 2 dx from 0 to 1. The thing is, this is worse. This is more complicated than what we started with. Instead of having just plain old x, I now have x squared. It's like we're going the wrong direction. So this is worse. So when you are looking to identify u and dv, you want to think, is one choice going to kind of reduce a term, make it a little bit simpler? Going from x to 1 feels like a simpler step than going from x to x squared over 2. So one 
principle when you're trying to identify terms here is anything that's like a polynomial, like x, x squared, x cubed. If those were the terms that you differentiated, you would go down in power, and that might be advantageous. It's not always going to be the correct direction to go, but certainly x to 1 was advantageous in this particular example. Another principle is that e to the x, it doesn't matter, right? So e to the x, if you anti-differentiate it or you differentiate it, you're not going to gain or lose complexity. So if e to the x is one of your terms, that probably is going to be the dv term because it's, it's not going to get worse when you anti-differentiate. Okay, so e to the x, you kind of let that one, you kind of pick that one last and see the other term, would you rather anti-differentiate it or differentiate it? And in the case of a polynomial, you definitely would rather differentiate it. In this example, we would like to compute the definite integral from 0 to 3 pi over 2 of x squared cosine of x dx. So in this integrand, we have the product of two distinct functions, x squared and cosine of x. When I'm looking at such an integral, I might think u sub first doesn't apply here. So instead, let's try to identify if one of these functions might get better after differentiating, whereas the other function might get better, or at least not worse, after anti-differentiating. If that's the case, then it's a, a good argument to make for integration by parts. Okay, so if we took x squared and we anti-differentiated it, we would get 1 3rd x cubed. That feels worse. However, if we differentiate it, we get 2x. x feels less complicated to me than x squared, so that seems good. Cosine of x, if we anti-differentiate it, we get sine of x. If we differentiate it, we get negative sine of x. Those are pretty much the same, just a constant difference. And also, it's not really worse than cosine. So let's try integration by parts, where we will let u be x squared, and dv will be cosine of x dx, like that. OK, this means du is 2x dx. v will be the antiderivative of cosine that's going to be sine of x. All right. It's just stepping back, kind of check these terms. They seem better to me than what we started with. So it feels like this is a good choice for integration by parts. All right, let's come over here. I'll go ahead and start to write the right-hand side. So the first term is u times v. That's x squared sine of x. We are going to evaluate that at the bounds, which are 0 and 3 pi over 2. Oops. From that, we will subtract off a definite integral from 0 to 3 pi over 2 of the second line. So I'll write that as 2x sine of x dx. This first term, we will start evaluating that in a minute. For the second term, let's take a look at this. In my opinion, this is simpler. It looks better than what we started with, but I'm not ready to actually state what the antiderivative of this expression is yet because I actually don't know it. So I'm looking again at the product of two expressions, which means what we're gonna do now is a second round of integration by parts. We kind of assess our situation here. One of my terms is 2x. If I anti-differentiate that, I get x squared. That kind of gets me back to where I started, and it's certainly not better than 2x. On the other hand, if I differentiate this, I'm left with a constant 2. Constants are always great, so differentiating this feels like the right thing to do. On the other hand, sine of x, if we differentiate it, we get cosine of x. Again, that goes back to where we started. If we anti-differentiate, we get negative cosine of x. That's okay. 
it's about equal complexity to sign, right? So this is going to be integration by parts again, where we will have u as 2x and dv as sine x dx. Okay, so that will be the breakdown for this second round. du is 2 dx. v is negative cosine of x. Be careful here not to lose that negative. Okay, again, looking at the next line, or the second line rather, v du is going to be negative 2 cosine of x, and that's great. That's exactly what we would want to see something that we could actually integrate right away. Okay, so let's keep going. Slide a little bit to the left. We'll need some room. Let's plug in now for this first term, which is already ready to go. We'll have 9 pi squared over 4 sine of 3 pi over 2. I'll write that once, but that's negative 1, minus 0. Okay, so that's the first expression here. Minus, be careful here to keep the negative out front, and then this whole integral here is going to be replaced by our second iteration of integration by parts. So that's going to be uv. So let me write negative 2x cosine of x. Going from 0 to 3 pi over 2 minus negative 2 cosine of x dx. Close that off. And this is a definite integral from 0 to 3 pi over 2. OK, let me just step back for a minute so that you can make sure that this second version of integration by parts looks correct. OK, I think we're ready. All right, sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. So this whole part here is going to become negative pi squared over 4, negative 9 pi squared over 4, rather. Let me leave it as negative out front, keep all of this inside of parentheses. Cosine 3 pi over 2 is 0. So that takes care of when we plug in this top bound. On the other hand, when I plug in the bottom bound, we have a leading term of 0 here. So actually, that's going to be 0 minus 0 minus, uh, let me go ahead and do plus plus like that. We'll do plus 2 sine of x going from 0 to 3 pi over 2. OK, at this point, we've done most of the work. We just have to get through to the end. We'll have this leading negative 9 pi squared over 4. Then minus 2 sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1 minus 0. Okay, that's basically it now. Let's write it one more time. So negative 9 pi squared over 4 plus 2. All right, let me step back and let you look at that. What is the antiderivative of natural log of x? I actually do not know at this moment. I don't have it memorized. It's not one that we really know off the top of our heads compared to our more famous antiderivatives. However, we can actually show you what the antiderivative of natural log of x is, and we're going to get there using integration by parts. So let's just compute the indefinite integral of natural log of x dx. It's not obvious that this is an integration by parts problem. If you're looking at this, you might say, hey, there's only one function. So you need two, right? You need a product in order to do integration by parts. But it's a little bit of a trick. So let's treat natural log of x as one of the terms and, and one dx as the rest. So we'll have u as natural log of x, dv as one dx. OK, a little bit of a twist. Differentiate, anti-differentiate. Definitely natural log of x is the kind of thing that you want to differentiate. When we do du, we will have 1 over x dx. 
That seems way better. V on the other hand is not too bad. It gets a little bit more complicated, but X is an okay function to work with. Okay, then looking at the second line, those seem reasonable. So let's go ahead and set up our right side for integration by parts. Okay, the first term is going to be X natural log of X. This is an indefinite integral, so I'm not going to have bounds here. Rather, at the end, we'll write plus C for constant of integration. Then minus the indefinite integral of V du, which is going to be really nice. When we multiply that together, that's going to be X times one over X dx. And that's going to cancel out and give us one. So we have, let me write plus C before I forget x natural log of x minus the antiderivative of 1 dx plus, or just general constant of integration. So the antiderivative of natural log of x is x natural log of x minus x plus constant of integration. And that's it. So if you ever need to figure out the antiderivative of natural log of x, you can set it up and solve it this way using integration by parts. Let's finish with this example. Kind of similar to the previous one, we're gonna use integration by parts, almost like a trick, to compute an antiderivative, and that's the de antiderivative of the sine function squared. I mentioned here another way that you can do this using the power reducing formula. That's not what we're gonna do in this example though. What we're going to do is say, sine squared of x is a product. It's sine of x multiplied by itself. Right. There's no choice really here to make. u will be one copy of the sine of x. dv will be the rest, so sine of x dx. So we'll let u be sine of x dv will be sine of x dx, like so. Okay, so that's how we're going to break up the original integral. Now going down to the next line, du is cosine of x, v is negative cosine of x. Oh, sorry. I want to write dv there, just like to be consistent. So du is cosine of x dx, and then v will be negative cosine of x, like that. Okay, certainly this line is not worse than how we started. It might not be clear that this is going to work out, but just trust me. So let's get going with our right-hand side. Okay, so using integration by parts, the antiderivative of sine of x squared after this decomposition using um, u and dv is going to be u times v, so that's negative sine of x cosine of x, minus the integral of v du. So that's going to be negative the cosine function squared. Okay, let's just do that. You might look at this cosine squared and say, aha, we're going to do that again. Another round of integration by parts with cosine times cosine. And if you do that, you'll actually revert back to sine squared, I think. So that's not the right way to go. Instead, we're going to use the fact that cosine squared of x is 1 minus sine squared of x. So let me rewrite this. I'm actually going to write the whole thing. So starting with our original expression. So we're going to say, what is the antiderivative of sine of x squared? Well, according to what we've done so far, it's minus sine of x cosine of x plus the integral of 1 minus sine squared of x dx. I'm going to break this into two. So let's say the integral of 1 dx 
minus the integral of sine squared. Like that. Okay, hope you can see this. So this one is, is easy. So antiderivative of one is x. Notice though that I've got back to where I've started. So this, at first glance, it might seem bad because it's like, isn't this what we're trying to solve for? And the answer is yes, and this is actually good because I have this expression appearing on the left and right hand sides of the equations. And if I move this over, if I collect like terms, what we're going to have is really an equation to solve for the unknown antiderivative of, of sine squared of x. So if I actually add this over to the, the left hand side, so I'd move it over, we can say two times what we want. is negative sine of x cosine of x plus x. And yeah, I'll just leave that. I was trying to think, should I add the constant of integration? I'm gonna wait one second. So okay. We want to solve for this. So let's solve for it like it's a variable in an algebra equation. Divide by two to isolate it. And at that point we'll have found the antiderivative. Let me actually take this, um, let me just divide by two like this. Okay, so there, we've solved for that, except I should include here a constant of integration. Okay, so with integration by parts and the Pythagorean identity kind of halfway through, we were able to solve for the indefinite integral of the sine function squared without ever doing what felt like a full round of, of integration, if you know what I mean. Rather, we wrote down an equation for this integral that we wanted to and solved for it like by just collecting like terms and isolating it. I just think that's kind of neat. So um, if you haven't seen this before, this is an alternative way to anti-differentiate sine squared. You can do the same thing with cosine squared. And if you like it, great. If you don't like it, that's okay. You can use the power reducing formula.